Um, hello, I'm uh, Daniel Phillips. I'm uh, better known as a uh, kernel developer in the Linux kernel. They uh, have a secret life as a 3D developer that goes back for 30 years actually. Um, and I have um, a project uh, that I've been working on for <clears throat> about uh, 10 years uh, or so called the uh, World Engine. And uh, recently that has uh, evolved into um, uh, an editor uh, with some interesting characteristics, I think, uh, called the uh, World Welder. And uh, this is the first time I've ever talked about it, or told anyone uh, about it. Um, I'm going to try and make this presentation as technical as, uh, as possible, uh, because uh, frankly my, um, my, my purpose here is to, um, is to uh, see if I can contrast uh, some developers in, uh, in uh, jumping in and, um, and uh, giving uh, me a hand with this. Uh, so what is this thing? Um, it's a solid modeling library uh, that uh, um, is intended primarily to be embedded in a real-time simulator. So uh, my, uh, my, my uh, dream and hope is to be doing uh, real-time uh, computational geometry, uh, so mesh, mesh building meshes on the fly uh, for 3D engines. Um, uh, there are many reasons for wanting to do that, uh, but just one of them is a multi-resolution modeling. If you uh, can have it, uh, build your meshes on the fly, you can, you can make tiny versions of meshes and elaborate them as you get closer and so on. Um, so, um, there's some crossover here with a little project called Blender. Uh, <laughs> and one can fairly ask, uh, why didn't I just join the Blender project and, and work with that? Um, well, uh, this project has a somewhat different set of assumptions. Um, it has that, um, uh, QT Front end, uh, Lua for scripting, um, version control, Mercurial, um, uh, C11. Okay, so I worked with a compiler that's like three weeks old. Uh, it's really cool. I highly recommend it, but I wouldn't uh, exactly recommend that for the Blender project, obviously. Um, okay, so here's a little bit of interface, and there's the mandatory. Uh, tea pot, and uh, we see there are uh, four views like uh, say Blender or Maya, um, so independent, uh, independently controlled uh, perspective. Um, here's the uh, a, a QT uh, interface. Uh, which is an option, so you can start up World Welder and say I want a uh, want it to run uh, on the metal on GLX or uh, or with QT. And uh, here are my uh, my poke buttons here, which are actually quite high tech because they uh, by bypass the uh, meta object compiler in QT, so that we can generate uh, these button connections on the fly according to the um, uh, kind of graphical interface we, we, we want. So it's, uh, it's uh, an awful lot more dynamic than um, QT's uh, standard way of approaching uh, the world. Uh, I know that this meeting is loaded with lots of um, GTK people and uh, you know, people and uh, so as the presenting a QT uh, interface, I'm going a little bit out on a limb. However, um, uh, I would uh, respect uh, uh, 
I would respectfully invite anyone who's interested in contributing a uh, GTK uh, backend to this. Uh, the patch would be happily accepted. Um, it's not very hard. Uh, I think the the total investment in building the QT uh, uh, backend was uh, about two weeks, and most of that was doing QT. Um, Again, life is a game engine, uh, and here is some terrain with some striped trees and so on. Um, I got to the point where I wanted that terrain to, be, to look better uh, with shadows, and I thought, well, how am I, how am I going to make shadows on this massive uh, terrain that goes out for uh, kilometers? Um, and started to work on a shadow algorithm that was uh, just narrowly supposed to work on uh, on a, a multi-resolution uh, surface like uh, like this one. I thought I could take advantage of various uh, simplifications, and that turned out to be completely wrong. And um, I failed at that completely, and backed up and, and said maybe I should take a really generic approach to this and, uh, and work with uh, generic meshes and see if I can compute shadows on those. So I got into half-edge um, meshes, which I'd never heard about before. I got some quotes in the deck of how people are, are using them. Uh, they're very definitely what people should be using these, these days. Um, uh, Blender should be doing half-edge meshes as well. I think uh, Blender people know that and, uh, and it was an attempt uh, to go there. Uh, but there were issues with the state of the art in half edge mesh at the time uh, that led to the current B mesh development, which is uh, considerably more complex than it needs to be, but does the job. Uh, in a perfect world, one day um, it should be very clear that World Welder is doing everything that. Wonder wants to do with with mesh, and maybe we can just move this new mesh over to Blender. Um, so um, I uh, pushed the envelope a little bit on uh, half edge meshing with a new kind of mesh called the uh, advanced half edge mesh, or AM, uh, who, uh, that has a couple of uh, important features. Um, one of them is uh, I actually was uh, quite pleased to find also used in the new um, CARVE uh, Boolean operations. By the way, uh, who knows about CARVE and Blender? CARVE library? Ah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, Boolean operations are incredibly important. They let you add geometric shapes together. They're also incredibly uh, difficult. So I noticed that the CARVE library, which is now uh, being used uh, in Blender, um, adopted half-edge mesh, so really good, and uh, adopted a particular improvement of the half-edge technique, which is to allow vertices to be shared um, between multiple surfaces. That's very important. So that's also one thing that I did in that The biggest thing that I did is I made boundary uh, rings uh, first class objects. So uh, half edge mesh uh, normally represents only a manifold object that's a completely closed man uh, surface. Um, uh, and if you want to have holes in that surface or boundaries, uh, you, you just uh, say you have a special face, which is the empty face, and you fill a bunch of uh, triangles with empty faces. So in world, uh, in, in the Aham uh, mesh, um, the boundary is actually part of the mesh design, and rather than being an extra feature feature added on, it's actually a simplification. Um, so here is a half edge mesh making a cube. Uh, each of those uh, different colored parts is a separate mesh part. That means it's not connected to any other mesh. The uh, white lines are the boundaries around 
uh, the outside of the mesh part. So each of those white boundaries is actually a half edge uh, in order to be a full edge that is an interior edge of the mesh. It, uh, it is joined with another half edge. So the cool thing about this is that um, when you join two mesh parts together that have boundaries, you don't allocate or, or free any, any edges in doing that. You just rearrange the pointers. Uh, and uh, in, in a complex mesh, uh, doing complex operations, that, uh, that really matters a whole lot. Um, so, um, features for world welder, and then it's just endless features that have to be added to make it useful. Uh, I've taken a stab at a few of the interesting ones. Beveling is, is, is an extremely important uh, feature. Here's uh, very early uh, beveling um, uh, uh, mesh uh, being uh, having its vertexes bevel. Uh, the red is one once, the, uh, the blue is uh, twice uh, recursive <coughs> vertex beveling. And uh, here's edge beveling, and uh, you see these kinds of, of uh, things in, 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 in Blender uh, as well. It's a, it's a huge topic all by itself. I mean, it would be a project all on its own. Um, let's move on from that. Uh, subdivision services, uh, Catmill, Clark, and Route 3. I've uh, done uh, so far no, uh, no creases and uh, boundaries are not handled yet, but it's still very useful. Uh, there's Catmull Clark uh, subdivision of a cube divided into triangles, which makes a lumpy uh, kind of uh, yellow thing. Uh, is my uh, mouse cursor on? Yes, it is. Okay, uh, lumpy yellow thing on the screen. Um, uh, Catmull Clark is not supposed to divide uh, triangles, by the way, let me ask how many people know that Catmull Clark is not supposed to be used on triangular meshes. Okay, um, so um, here uh, is a, uh, uh, one of these kinds of objects, uh, and the mesh is lit. So that's what it looks like in real life. This is, this is how the computer makes it. Um, so I came up with a new modeling uh, paradigm based on the rings that are supported in, in the advanced half-edge mesh, which uh, seems to be an ex uh, extremely powerful and, and natural modeling method at the same time. Uh, so the problem we're solving here is how do I stick things together to make complex uh, geometry? Um, and the way we do it is by uh, gluing rings together. We make objects that have boundary rings on them. Um, we uh, make another object that has a matching uh, ring in the opposite direction. Those two objects can uh, can be mated, um, uh, or they can be filled uh, with uh, with some triangles to make a, a, a cube or whatever. So with this technique, you can make uh, pretty much anything that it's possible to make. Um, so here's a, a series of pictures um, that demonstrate. Uh, how it works. Uh, by the way, I was uh, planning to run some demonstrations here, some demos, uh, but I had issues with the uh, audio-visual, uh, with, uh, with the uh, um, monitor, it means I can't run any actual code, just show the slides. So uh, here we have two boundary rings running in opposite directions. If you look very closely, you can see the arrows on the white uh, rings running in opposite directions. Um, this uh, two, uh, two rings are uh, joined, what I call a uh, collar, uh, with triangles. Uh, edges are shown in green. Uh, there's also some numbers there. Those are the um, IDs of the uh, meshes, the internal IDs for the meshes, uh, uh, for the for the half edge, half edges. Uh, so what I do here, I just join two rings t 
to, to, to make a thing with a hole. Now, let's make it torus. Um, uh, we start with uh, a ring, which is just a square, um, and uh, we make a copy of that ring inside it, running in the opposite direction, and we make a copy of that pair of things as some offset. Um, so you can copy any mesh, including a boundary ring, uh, with an arbitrary transformation. That's what you do here. Uh, so that gives you the basic structure that, you, that you're going to fill in and turn into topology. Um, all those rings are slightly different colors because they're all separate mesh parts. Now, uh, we um, add some triangles to join some of these uh, rings together. Um, We've got the interior is one part going around the middle of the torus and the uh, collar that I showed before. Uh, fill in uh, the rest with uh, triangles and then do uh, something that I call gluing, which is gluing boundaries together to make interior edges. Um, fill with triangles and there is, well, a very blocky torus. And of course, we'll subdivide that and make it a beautifully smooth torus. So we also do this with much more complex objects. Uh, here's a, a, a wheel. Um, you see, um, we have lots of boundary rings on the inside of the rim. This uh, wheel is not a closed uh, manifold yet. It still has lots of holes in it. It's not ready to be uh, subdivided. Um, so we'll go and fill in those holes and, uh, and subdivide it uh, with Captain Rom in this case, uh, Captain Clark, sorry. Uh, getting this uh, mesh, so it looks kind of pretty. Uh, uh, turn on the lights and, uh, and there we have a wheel. This is going to be a catapult wheel in a, uh, in a game. Um, so this uh, wheel uh, has, uh, besides looking kind of cool and ancient, it has a lot of lumps on it. That's a result of uh, Capital Park subdivision, which has all kinds of issues. Um, this is uh, the wheels are parameterized so that I can, uh, you know, have any number of spokes or any size and so on. And so we have some uh, degree of parameterization um, now. Um, so once we make a mesh like this, uh, there's a lot of triangles in it, um, uh, hundreds of thousands in these images. So uh, we need to optimize it for display more well. There has a mesh uh, compiler to do that. It turns uh, any mesh into triangle strips and tries to make the strips as long as it can. It's quite successful at that. It's a very fast compiler. Um, and uh, the result is that, uh, that these um, meshes render at, uh, at real-time rates, uh, 30 to 60 frames a second, and so on. Um, so uh, to address the lumpiness problems in subdivision, I went and looked at other uh, subdividers. Root 3 subdivision, very interesting. Um, here's a root 3 subdivided. Uh, we always see that uh, regular, a lot more regular patterns uh, on my subdivision hull, because it's part of the uh, solution. And also root 3 is just a much better uh, behaved mathematical formula. Uh, so we end up, in this case, with something that uh, approaches the kind of quality that you need for a CAD, uh, CAD system. We have very, very high quality uh, uh, curved surfaces here. It is, in general, much easier to mo uh, model lumpy surfaces than to model smoothly curved surfaces with uh, subdivision modeling. So it's actually easier to do something like uh, a human head than it is to get uh, get those uh, spokes smooth. Um, uh, there's uh, contour mapping uh, physicality that again works with arbitrary meshes. And by arbitrary meshes, I mean basically anything, any number of components, uh, uh, holes, connectivity. Um, 
Uh, here is a contour view of a, a little mountain. There we go. Um, a, uh, an octahedron, uh, so it's not limited to, to just height maps. You can do any 3D object. And there is the wheel as a, as a contour map. Um, so uh, I have uh, some pretty interesting ideas for what to do with the contour representation in, uh, in game engine rendering. But one thing that it can do right now is the same algorithm can be used to cut uh, arbitrary meshes. Um, let's skip ahead to my elevation services here. Um, what you see there is a very finely tessellated uh, flat uh, uh, sheet of mesh, as I call it sheet. And I have uh, uh, made an interesting height map, uh, maps and cubes into that space. Um, uh, add cubes to uh, ovals. Um, and then what I want to do is, is something interesting. I want to make a of a, a, a plane of cut for the whole thing, um, which is, a, there's an algorithm for that. Here we have uh, separated a mesh into two parts, two colors. Now you see there's boundary rings uh, between them. Um, turn the lights on. Uh, now what we want to do um, is fill in those flat faces to make those solid objects again, and then we can call this a real solid modeler. Uh, what I needed for that is a, a polygon uh, tessellator to fill in um, the, the complex uh, polygon that you see uh, in white there. So here is a little bit of polygon tessellation. Uh, triangulation in itself is a, is, is a huge complex algorithm. Here is a complex face being filled, and that uh, face is the is the face on this object. So we've got now some solid modeling happening. Uh, more complex slicing, more complex slicing yet, um, and the kick is slice that's not uh, a horizontal plane. Um, so um, I guess I have about three more minutes, and uh, here's a tie-in with the previous uh, presentation. Um, uh, to exercise the meshing, I decided to do some fonts, uh, work with font outlines and fill them in, subdivide them. Uh, here's uh, one of those, it makes lovely 3D text. Um, here's uh, a little more. and. Um, here is what it looks like before we subdivide. It's, uh, it's just, you know, blocky uh, looking uh, characters and uh, turn on the subdivision and, uh, and you get uh, that kind of stuff. Um, I think I have time to go back to... Have time for questions? Um, I have time for questions. I have time for... A couple of minutes with questions. Uh, if I was to correct it correctly, uh, we defined a constructs. We do modeling by defining the constructs and then filling them, right? So the question is uh, do we define models by defining functions? Um, we define models by creating uh, boundary rings and connecting them to each other. So sorry if I confused you by showing the contours. The contour is something we do after we have a complete 3D model. Uh, and uh, we have uh, for rings, we have directions to uh, be able to fill them. Uh, when I do modeling, with this thread. Um, do I need to care about the directions? You need to care about the directions very much. Um, so um, only opposite rings will mate, and they will only mate if they have uh, ex uh, exactly the same vertices, and they can be glued to continuous surface. I see. 
uh, is it uh, considered to um, transfer this task of taking direction in your account to the software, not to the user? The software does uh, pretty much all of that. Um, as a user, though, you need to understand uh, what can meet to what in order to to make it fit together. It's not not very difficult to understand. The, the uh, uh, computer does the uh, does the hard work. Uh, I, I see. So if I will have two rings with the same directions, uh, I will not get a result, or I will get wrong result. It uh, it won't look. Um, it, uh, it, it, they won't glue to form interior edges. If they're separate and you say join them with triangles, uh, you'll get twisted triangles. Twisted. Yeah, you'll see that uh, right away. Um, so there is an operation just to flip it and make it go the other way. So there, there are all kinds of editing operations to, to help you. Uh, um, there's no reason artists have to be uh, bothered with this. Uh, by the way, this is probably about a year away uh, from um, being usable by artists. Um, it, it, it now makes some very useful objects under program control. Uh, can be scripted in Lua, so we can also you can also script uh, your graphics. Uh, but right now, it is a 3D graphics programmer's project. Uh, a year from now, I hope maybe I can come back to the Libra Graphics meeting and invite uh, the artists to uh, to jump in. Uh, I ask you this question because uh, I have worked with Cynthia and a few years ago, uh, it uh, had you know, the same problem uh, when of teaching curves, not rings, but curves, it's two dimensional curves. And uh, the uh, user had to deal with directions at the same time. And finally, it was decided to uh, put this uh, task to the software. In this case, I see the problem is more complex, but uh, if uh, I could be found a way to to have a user not to care about the directions. I think it will, yes. will increase the productivity. I think we will find such a way, especially if you offer your input. So um, you can come up to me uh, afterwards and carry on that discussion. I guess uh, I have pretty much used up my time. I'd be uh, more than happy to do uh, demonstrations as soon as I disconnect from the uh, uh, projector here I can show some pretty neat stuff. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for attending. I know it's been a long day and uh, we need to get uh, to the uh, uh, beer drinking session <laughs> as soon as we can. <laughs>